Well, we should make a start. Good morning to you all. Uh, welcome to the Lord's house. It's been another week. The Lord has been with you, I trust. He has blessed you, your labors. Uh, for those who are here for the first time, any chance, there, we study the precious remedies against Satan's devices, a book by Thomas Brooks. And today we're at lesson number 11. Lesson number 11 in the first section of the book, Satan's devices to draw the soul to sin. Twelve devices and their remedies. Just to recap from last week, we were device number nine, and we back in device number nine today by presenting to the soul the crosses, losses, reproaches, sorrows, and sufferings which daily attend those who walk in the way of holiness. And there are seven precious remedies to this device of Satan. And we only observed remedy number one last week, and uh, there were seven sub-points to that precious remedy. Uh, The first remedy was the following, solemnly to consider that all the afflictions that attend the people of God are such as shall turn to their profit and glorious advantage. And there were seven sub points under that, and we spent some time in that. It was really worthwhile, I felt. Uh, The seven, just to summarize those seven sub-points, believers, through their affliction, will discover the filthiness and vileness of their sin. So uh, when we're afflicted, uh, particularly when we're afflicted because of our own sin, we're drawn to understand and see the vileness, the filthiness of sin. The second advantage to the affliction for the believer was afflictions are, will contribute to the mortifying and purging away of our sins. Afflictions will contribute, uh, I'm sorry, number three, afflictions are sweet preservatives to keep the saints from sin. And so when you're afflicted and when you have trials and when you feel life is too much, uh, to turn that into your advantage and using those Uh, afflictions to keep your soul from sin. Afflictions lift up the soul to a more rich, clear, and full enjoyments of God. And uh, isn't it true that when we're brought low, whether through sickness or other trial, that's the time when we cry out to God. And so we should use that uh, as a remedy to draw our souls away from sin and closer to God. Afflictions serve to keep the hearts of the saints humble and tender. Uh, when we're afflicted, there's nothing like feeling helpless. You can't do anything about your circumstances. You can't do anything uh, about your health that may be failing. So they keep us humble and our consciences tender. Afflictions serve to bring the saints nearer to God and to make them more persistent and earnest in prayer to God. We kind of mentioned that already. Uh, the illness, affliction, trial uh, should turn us to God and not away from him and become more earnest in prayer. And the seventh advantage to affliction for believer from the first remedy serve to revive and recover decayed graces. So that's uh, remedy number one under device number nine. And there are still six remedies under this device of Satan. So we'll start with remedy number two today. You should have an outline. It's page one and two printed back and front. There are two different outlines out there, so make sure you have the right one for this morning. As we come to study, let's turn to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we bless you that this is the day that you have made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it as we draw aside from a busy week in our work, in whatever we've been busy doing, where we faced perhaps afflictions and trials, difficulties in the home, in work, in whatever we've been doing. We thank you that we can draw aside now and sit at your feet, the Lord Jesus Christ, that you may teach us from the scriptures that our souls this day may be revived, that we would be acutely aware of the devices of Satan and turn to scripture and Uh, capture scripture and hide it in our hearts that we would not sin against you. Bless our worship today. Help us to concentrate our thoughts on you, on your word, on your glory, on your praise, and turn from the busyness of the week 
the things that have preoccupied us. Bless us, Lord, we pray, and help us in Christ's name. Amen. So device number nine, device number nine, let's read that again. It's Satan, by presenting to the soul the crosses, losses, reproaches, sorrows, and sufferings which daily attend those who walk in the way of holiness. So by that, by way of reminder, Satan, by this device, will point out to the soul that those in the world that will walk circumspectly and in a godly way endure much more suffering, affliction, distress than those who do not and those who live only for themselves and their own sinful desires. He would have us believe that the miseries that come upon us uh, will be like Job's messengers, messengers who come one after another and there will be no end to your sorrows and your troubles if you follow Christ, if you take up your cross, as we noted last week, and follow him, deny yourself, uh, there will be these afflictions. And Satan says, why? Why would you choose that difficult life? life? Take the easy path. You have time to think about the Lord and his ways and his demands on your life later. So we pick up then at remedy number two, going through to seven, six more precious remedies to this device of Satan. Remedy number two that should be in your outline, solemnly to consider that all the afflictions which befall the saints only reach their worst part. They reach not, they hurt not their noble part, their best part. Once again, Brooks's language there, a little confusing maybe in the 21st century. In other words, the greatest afflictions that may come to the child of God no matter how severe, cannot harm our souls, cannot harm the most important part, our souls. In fact, if we consider God's purpose in our afflictions, and by the, this time, you should have a pretty good idea of an outline, if you like, of the purpose of afflictions, namely two things, they are for God's glory and they are for our own good. So if we consider that, uh, that is to say, they may, may not be hard and painful and at times uh, unbearable, but we need constantly to remind ourselves that ultimately whatever affliction we have are from the hand of God, and that should be a comfort, for God comforts the heart. And Job's a very good example of this, isn't it? Uh, it wasn't a man who had sinned in any particular way at the time. And the Lord came to Satan and said, have you seen my servant Job who's blameless? So that whole scenario may even seem a little unfair to us when you look at Job's case. And First Peter 1 and 6, 9, talking about the comfort that we get in our afflictions. In this reading, you rejoice Though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, that may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not see him now, you believe in him. Rejoice with joy that is inexpressible, filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Great comfort there for the believer under affliction, and it's a normal thing. And if the apostles were afflicted in great ways, and if men of God down through the centuries have been afflicted in great ways, we will not be exempt. And Satan will throw everything at you to discourage you and say, this path you have chosen is a cross to bear. It's trials, daily trials that will come upon you. Why would you choose this life? I love John Bunyan's hymn. Listen to the last two verses. Though this world with devils filled should threaten to undo us, we shall not fear, for God hath willed his truth to triumph through us. The prince of darkness grim, we tremble not for him, his rage, who can endure? For lo, his doom is sure. One little word shall fell him. That word above all earthly powers, no thanks to them abideth. The spirit and the gifts are ours through him who with us sideth. Let goods and kindred go. This mortal life also, the body 
they may kill, God's truth abideth still, his kingdom is forever. As First Peter tells us in 3 and verse 13, Now who is there to harm you if you are zealous for what is good? Afflictions may harm the body. They may even kill us if that is God's will, but they cannot hurt what is important, and that's Brooks's remedy here. They may take away my life, but they cannot take away my God, my Christ, and my crown, uh, the crown that will be ours uh, for the afflic- affliction that we endured as we suffer with Christ. As Paul said, he considers his suffering as suffering with Christ. So that first precious remedy, or, or number two, solemnly to consider that all the afflictions that befall the saints only reach their worst part. They reach not, they hurt not, their noble part, the best part, our souls, our souls. So afflictions will cause you great distress, may cause you great discomfort. Uh, it's not nice to fall ill, it's not nice to face temptation, but they are there to strengthen us, to purify us, and they cannot hurt the best part, your soul. So, remedy number three. Number three, remedy seriously to consider that the afflictions that attend the saints in the ways of holiness are but short and momentary. Afflictions that attend the saints in the ways of holiness are but short and momentary. In Psalm 30 verse 5, for his anger is but for a moment, and his favor is for a lifetime. Weeping may tarry for the night, but joy comes in the morning. And Brooks says of this precious remedy, this short storm will end in an everlasting calm. This short night will end in a glorious day that shall never have end. It is but a very short time between grace and glory, between our title to the crown and our wearing the crown, between our right to the heavenly inheritance and our possession of the heavenly inheritance. What is our life but a shadow, a bubble, a flower, a runner, a spam, a dream, a dream so in comparison to everlasting life that Jesus came to give to us. He who believes in me will not die. <laughs> he will live even though he dies. So the, this life really is short, momentary afflictions. Consider that the Lord is gracious. And he knows that each, what each one of us is able to bear. Every one of us who bear afflictions, one time or another, have also known the intermissions, ease and rest, the blessed times of peace and joy, more than we deserve, and Satan won't point that out to you. And even in this week, if you look back, and you may think there wasn't a day where there wasn't a difficulty or a trial, a difficult person, something I faced, maybe illness that came to you, uh, whatever these very trials that James talks about come to us, but you also consider as you look back down upon the history of your life, the blessedness, the intermissions, the periods of peace and grace, the blessed times with your family, the blessed time in communion with God that you have endured, enjoyed. We endure momentary afflictions compared to the surpassing glory that will be ours for all eternity. And John, in his gospel, compares this to a woman who's in labor. John 16, 21, he says, When a woman is giving birth, she has sorrow for what is about to come. And having witnessed my wife give birth to our two girls, oh boy, that's not something I want to face, and my daughter, in fact. But when she's delivered the baby, she no longer remembers the anguish for joy that a human being has been brought, for the joy that a human being has been brought into the world. And so... John compares this and he says our momentary afflictions, they pale into insignificance when we know that we shall wear that crown. We shall wear that crown and we will enjoy eternity with God forever. Brothers and sisters, we live in a modern world where everything is made so easy for us. And any measure of discomfort or affliction can quickly become a source of great irritation and discontentment. Uh, you've heard people say, why does it have to be, have to be 
so hard. And the truth is, we live in a world which has a way of softening us. I caught a little bug somewhere yesterday, and I was been for two days feeling so nauseous. And we become irritated, and we become, why must I feel like this? And a little bit of a fever coming to you. Uh, and these are momentary afflictions. These things are truly to be seen as a blessing from God too. But when real and hard trials and afflictions come, we need to be ready and strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. We need to look to him for strength, for endurance, need to see the joy in the outcome, as James tells us. In these days, we require endurance under trials. And Hebrews 10, 39, it's a great passage here from verse 39, 36, in fact, if you have need of, for you have need of endurance, for that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what is promised. For yet a little while, and the coming one will come and will not delay, but my righteous one shall live by faith. And if he shrinks back, my soul is no pleasure in him. But we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed, but of those who have faith and per- persevere in their souls. And really, we need to go back to the example of the Lord Jesus Christ ever before us, who endured the cross, scorning its shame for the joy set before him. Isaiah 61 is a prophetic passage, and it's about the Lord Jesus Christ and the year of his favor. And it speaks there of the comfort and the blessing that the Messiah brings to his church. Listen to verse 3. To grant to those who mourn in Zion, to give them a beautiful headdress instead of ashes, oil of gladness instead of mourning, the garment of praise instead of a faint spirit, that they may be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. So seriously to consider that the afflictions that attend the saints in the ways of holiness are but short and momentary, and you may look at others, you may look at yourself, and you may think, I have a much worse deal here, and others seem to have it a lot easier. Whatever it is that comes to us from the hand of God is in his control, and his hand brings them to you. They are for your good, they are for his glory, they are momentary. No matter how heavy you may feel the trial is, compared to the surpassing greatness of spending eternity with him. Remedy number four, precious remedy number four, seriously to consider that the afflictions which befall the saints are such as proceed from God's dearest love. And here's a big lesson for us to learn. Seriously to consider that the afflictions which befall the saints are such as proceed from from God's dearest love. And remember, by way of reminder, when we talk about afflictions, we're talking about the whole scope of afflictions. Whether it be affliction because you have sinned and you know you have sinned and, and God is chastising you as a legitimate son, whether it just be, I don't know why God did this, it's for a trial to test you, to refine you, uh, for whatever reason, it's from His hand. And they proceed from God's dearest love. And we need to remember this, and we need to believe this. In the vision that John had in Revelation, the Isle of Patmos, and in the letter to those seven churches, we reminded that God rebukes and chastises those whom he loves. Revelation 3.19, those whom I love, I reprove and discipline, so be zealous and repent. And we've spoken about this in terms of our own children. How sad it is when you see a child just running riot, both parents there, and there is no discipline. And there's no discipline. And when we discipline our children, no matter how painful it may seem and the tears that follow, it surely is because we love them, because we want to shape their character. That's exactly what we're doing. And that is what God is doing. He's conforming us slowly, all the more and more, to the image of his dear son. It's motivated 
by love. God says to his children, don't think I hate you because I discipline you. The one who escapes discipline must question his adoption. Brooks says, God has one son without corruption, but no son without correction. And and Augustine has a great quote, I think I put in the the outline. If he were to be beloved, how come he'd be to be sick? So wicked men are apt to say because they don't know that corrections are pledges of our adoption and badges for our sonship. God has one son without sin, but none without sorrow. Now, monthly men's study that Pastor George is taking us through the little book, Just Do Something. And this is all about the will of God and discovering God's will. And with all our uncertainties regarding God's will for our life, this one thing has been become very clear from the scriptures with regard to God's what God's will is for our lives. And that's 1 Thessalonians 4, 4 and verse 3. For this is the will of God, your sanctification. So amidst all the uncertainties, what job shall I choose? What shall I do this? What church should I go to? All these things that we would just love to have God's direct guidance for, there are some things that are very clear. This is the one thing, your sanctifications. When Ephesians tells us that it was in love that he predestined us, this act of love was so that we may be conformed to the image of his son, so that we may do those good works he prepared in advance for us to do. And it is because of his great love that we are being conformed to the image of his son. This will involve trial. This will involve testing, affliction, discipline as true sons. And this is what we are. As one John says, we are sons of God. And if we are sons by adoption, why should we expect any treatment different to that of a legitimate son? Listen to Brooks again. He says, a soul at first conversion is but a rough cast. But God by affliction does square and fit and fashion it for glory above which shows that discipline flows from precious love. Therefore, the afflictions which attend the people of God should be no bar to holiness, nor no motive to draw the soul to ways of wickedness. Seriously to consider that the afflictions which befall the saints are such as proceed from the dearest love of God. A wonderful point, a precious remedy Uh, When trials befall you, when illness comes upon you, when some other affliction comes to you, see it for what it is. It is from the hand of a God who loves you and is conforming you to the image of his son. Doing well, remedy number five, remedy number five. Solemnly to consider that it is our duty and glory Not to measure our afflictions by the smart, but by the end. Again, some fancy language here. It's our duty and glory not to measure our afflictions by the smart, but by the end. And this is something we've considered already in previous remedies. The end and the final purpose of our affliction. But Brooks adds an important angle to it here. We've noted the momentary nature of our afflictions compared to our eternal weight of glory, we've considered the purpose of our affliction, our sanctification, our being conformed to the image of our Lord Jesus Christ. And Philippians in chapter 1 verse 6, a great, great verse in this regard, that speaks about God who began the good work in us that will be brought to completion of the day of Christ. So afflictions, the testing of faith, Chastisement for sin, temptations are for our good and ultimately for the glory of God. But this remedy, in this we are reminded that we are not to measure our afflictions by their intensity or their duration, but rather to keep that good end in mind. The final salvation of our souls on that day when Christ presents his church, his bride, to God without spot or blemish, perfect before the Father. 
Not always that easy to do. But if we consider the end, this should be a precious remedy to our hearts and to our souls. And Brooks gives us a number of examples from Scripture here. We're not going to go into them. The Israelites, who were eventually dismissed in Egypt uh, after their slavery, with gold and earrings sent on their way. And the long-awaited captivity in Babylon, they were released uh, with gifts of gold and jewels and all things necessary to go to rebuild the temple. Uh, We are to look more at the latter end as a Christian than the beginning of his affliction. Consider the patience of Job and how it ended with even more prosperity. Lazarus uh, and Joseph and David and Stephen, who when the heavens were opened, he was just a moment away from glory as those stones fell upon his ears, as Brooks puts it there. And Paul, in his suffering and affliction, consider them everything but, but dross, but nothing compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. Listen to Brooks again. He says, afflictions are but a dirty lane to a royal palace. Now tell me, souls, whether it be not a very great madness to shun the ways of holiness and to walk in the way of wickedness because of those afflictions which attend the ways of holiness. Afflictions are but our father's goldsmiths who are working to add pearls to our crowns. That's rather nicely put there. The Apostle Paul gives a great illustration of the value of this remedy in in Philippians chapter 3, when he speaks of what I just mentioned, the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ. Listen to Philippians 3 from verse 7. But whatever gain I had, I counted loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish, in order that I may gain Christ, be found in him, not having a righteousness of our own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him, the power of his resurrection, that I share in his sufferings, becoming like him, in his death, that by any means possible, I may attain the resurrection from the dead. That third aspect of salvation, when we will be with the Lord forever, when he presents his church as his bride spotless before God. So solemnly to consider that it is our duty and glory not to measure our afflictions by the smart, by the intensity, but by the end. Two more to go. Remedy number six. Seriously to consider that the design of God in all the afflictions which befall them is only to try them. It is not to wrong them nor to ruin them as ignorant souls are apt to think. And I've often heard unbelievers say, how can God allow this to happen And it's one of his children. And they do not understand. And they do not understand God's end, God's purpose, and the glory which awaits the believer. Seriously to consider the design of God and all the afflictions which befall them is only to try them. It is not to wrong them. It's not to ruin them as ignorant souls are apt to think. And the history of the Israelites is a good example of this in Deuteronomy 8 and verse 2. And you shall remember the whole way that the Lord your God has led you these 40 years in the wilderness. And that couldn't have been easy at all. That he might humble you, testing you to know what is in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. And unfortunately, they failed horribly. Even as we come to Malachi, the last writing of the Old Testament, we see that their hearts are far from him. But there is good news. There is good news because after 400 years of waiting, as we'll see, the Lord himself will come.
The Lord himself will come. That will involve the turning of hearts to him. So they're not for our ruin. They are to try us. Uh, Of course, the book of James must come to mind here, since he expressly says that the trials of many kinds are for the testing of our faith. So yes, sometimes the trials that befall us, befall us, the afflictions that come our way are simply to this end, to test our faith, to test our faith, to purify us like the refiner's fire and the fuller's soap, which we'll see next time in the book of Malachi. That process that leads to maturity for the people of God, that we may be Perfect, as James says, mature, not lacking anything. And today, as I mentioned, particularly in the coming of the Lord to his temple, the coming of Christ to earth, that is a refiner's fire and at fuller's soap. That was the main purpose of the work of Christ in coming uh, to save us, yes, but to purify, to test our faith. Listen to First Peter in verse 1. This is a classic passage here. So that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Brothers and sisters, there's an important implication here. It's so important. If we do not endure the trial, the persecution, the affliction, and when our faith fails, and when we turn back again to the easy path, the path of our former way of life, in sin, our faith was never genuine. And so we see even the Lord Jesus Christ turning to the would-be disciples. I would follow you, but... My parents are old. I've got to go bury them first. Would be disciple and his faith failed. So our afflictions are a test to purify us. Let's remember the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. Sad time to the apostle Peter. Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you that he might sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. When you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. And we are no better than Peter. And Satan would have each one of us. He would sift you like wheat. Brothers and sisters, this is our confidence. Christ and Christ alone. He who ever lives to intercede for us. And it is Christ who confirmed that the children of God are those whom the Father has given to him, and nothing can pluck us out of his hand. So don't allow affliction, distress, and doubt to come. Our faith is our, and our confidence is grounded on the promises of God and the work of Christ on the cross. And if you belong to him, if you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, no matter how fiery the trial is that comes your way, And Satan say to God, I would sift him. I would have you, but I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail, that you may strengthen your brothers. That's another aspect of affliction we haven't looked at, affliction that we have so that we can be an encouragement to those who are afflicted in the same way we have. Seriously to consider that the design of God in all the afflictions which befall them, is only to try them. Yes, there may be no other reason for the affliction that you endure, but God simply testing your faith, refining it as with a fire. It's not to wrong you, to ruin you, as ignorant souls are apt to think. Final remedy, remedy number seven. Solemnly to consider that the afflictions Wrath and misery which attend the way of wickedness are far greater and heavier than those which attend the way of holiness. So even when Satan comes and says, consider the affliction, the daily trials, Christ said it, you better believe it. This is where Satan would not distract from the word. He would say, yes, 
You got to deny yourself. You got to take up your cross and follow Christ. You may be persecuted. You may be afflicted. You may you will come under great trials. So take the easy path. And Brooks reminds us now: consider the afflictions of the wrath and misery which attend the way of wickedness are far greater and heavier than those that attend the way of holiness. Once again, in a previous remedy, uh, as in a previous remedy, you reminded that the afflictions of the wicked are far greater than they seem, since they endure from this life right into the next. And Isaiah notes here, the wicked are like the troubled sea which cannot rest, whose waters cast up mire and dirt. There is no peace for the wicked, says my God. And sometimes, like Psalm 73, we look at the wicked and say, what a wife of ease, life of ease, how they prosper. But we don't understand also the calamities and, and the afflictions that come upon the wicked and, and their restlessness of souls and their wanting of more and their not ever being satisfied and their absolute terror of losing the wealth they've accumulated. And brothers and sisters, that will run into eternity. That will run into eternity. And Brooks says, The curse of God, the wrath of God, the hatred of God, and the fierce indignation of God always attend sinners walking in the way of wickedness. In Psalm 73, as we quoted in our previous lesson, when the psalmist was perplexed at the apparent prosperity of the wicked until he came to the sanctuary of God and perceived the end. And I must end with this. Uh, if there are any here who, if you're not a believer to, uh, today, uh, perhaps you're feeling okay. Perhaps you see now that afflictions attend the righteous and the unrighteous. And perhaps you're feeling, I can take whatever life sends my way. I'll take the afflictions like you do. Everyone suffers to some degree or another. Perhaps the consideration, the trials and afflictions that attend the way of believers frightens you. Uh, don't be fooled. You will face both the uncertainties of this life as well as the very sure certainties of life after death without God. Without God. Choose life today. Come to Christ. Repent of your sin. Believe in Him. Believe in Christ and Christ alone for your salvation. Speak to anybody here, uh, here who suffer great affliction, and all or many of us have to some degree or another. There's some people sitting here being brought right to death's door. But I can tell you now, if you ask them, they will not exchange the darkest and the hardest trial for the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus, our Lord. Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by Him. But brothers and sisters, we are on a blessed road. No matter what the affliction, I urge each one of you to press on, stand firm in the faith, accept with great joy the many trials that will come your way. For, as James says, you know the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. Let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Solemnly to consider that the afflictions, wrath, and misery which attend the ways of wickedness are far greater and heavier than those which attend the way of holiness. Those then are six precious remedies to this device of Satan, and we have couple minutes, if there's any comments or questions. Yes, brother. Thank you. You have many good thoughts with this. Um, two things. I'm personally reminded that in this congregation, I've heard people speak of the greatest blessing coming from the greatest trial, whether it's uh, cancer or a heart transplant or a pulmonary embolism. They've been made to uh, trust God more, have their priorities established. We talk about being made more ready for
Amen. Thank you, Pastor George. And isn't it a wonderful uh, thought that Brooks gives us that the trial and affliction that comes, that God, God's goldsmiths fashioning that crown and adding another jewel uh, to that final day where we will uh, reign with him, be with him forever. Any other comments, questions? Chuck. <laughs> Thank you. That, that's a great illustration. I've been to Chuck's laboratory just two weeks ago, and it's messy in there. There's grinders, and it's, it's like spraying the stuff, and, and it's hard to believe that he showed me one or two sets of dentures that he made. He makes a good set of teeth, by the way, and, and they're just beautiful. They like jewels, but to get to that place is, like Brooke says, a dirty, dark road. <laughs> and to get to that point. And so our sanctification through trial, through difficulty, through affliction uh, will eventually produce a, a wonderful result. Uh, and we will wear that crown of righteousness and be with the Lord forever. Thank you, Chuck. That's a great illustration. Right, I think our time is gone, so let's close in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that we can be encouraged when afflictions and trials of many kinds come our way, Lord, help us to consider them, as your word tells us, as a means of great joy, because they will lead to our sanctification, they will lead to the man of God being perfect in every way. And we look forward to that day when you come again and you will complete that work which you begun in each one of us. Oh Lord, help us to see the trials and afflictions that come as something that comes from your loving hand to test us, to strengthen us, to conform us more to the image of your dear Son. And we look forward to that day. Even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus, we pray. Bless us, Lord, in our time of fellowship Bless the preaching of the word, the reading of scripture, the prayers, the singing of hymns. Own our worship today, we pray. Come and be amongst us and help us, for without you we can do nothing. We give you thanks in Christ's name and for his glory. Amen. Thank you all for your attention.